Um, hi, I'm Ray, thanks for coming. Um, one quick uh, addition to what Mary was saying about the fact that these are all rubber, um, which is that most of them, if not all of them, start out as being modeled in clay, and then I make a very traditional mold, and then I pour in the rubber in different colors, and very often I'll put in a phosphorescent pigment so that <clears throat> Were we able to get rid of all the ambient light in here and make it completely dark, some of these things would glow in the dark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I guess the real question is, you know, what's what's going on here? <laughs> That's the real question. So uh, if you will bear with me being a little bit long-winded before I get to the answer, um, I'll tell you. As Mary pointed out, for decades now, since the late 80s, early 90s, I've made the studio my subject matter. And for me, the studio has been, since that time, both figuratively and actually, um, a place of collapse, uh, slightly outdated, uh, a place of ruin, um, something a little bit archaic. And um, if you want to know why, um, just uh, those of you who are old enough, cast your mind back to the fact that it was in the early 1990s that we first began the digital revolution, for instance which meant that I was made in a completely different way than it had been by hand in the studio. Um, on top of that, of course, real estate prices soared. Now, artists have always had a hard time meeting the rent for studios. But in the 80s and 90s, at least in New York, where I work, I'm sure around the world, basically, it became astronomical, and more and more artists were unable to afford studios. So we did constantly in the fear of losing our studios. Finally, in the, um, not finally, but another point is that in, in, in the ladies, it was still not that great for women uh, in the art world. And so when I entered the art world, which is to say I entered the studio, um, it felt a little uncomfortable. Um, that is, it didn't feel like a place that was completely, you know, um, catered for me. Um, it had been filled up to that point, um, really with a figure of the isolated romantic individual male genius. Um, and so that felt a little bit outdated to me too. Uh, it made me feel like a little incongruous. Um, on top of that, you know, I and most of everybody and most all the artists I knew were working in places that were literally falling apart. They were old sweatshops, they were old factories, and up until very recently that's where I've been working, in places that were uh, literally collapsed. Um, so there were all these reasons to think the studio somehow compromised, and yet I was totally in love with being in the studio, and totally in love with this sort of old-fashioned process, modeling by hand, and casting, and all that. So the question was, how could I continue to do what I love, um, and yet still sort of acknowledge in the work the sort of discomfort I felt about this situation, and about where art was at that moment? Um, and I thought, well, simple enough. If a studio is a ruin, then you can excavate it. You can treat it like an archaeological site. You can dig things up out of it. You can inventory it. You can map it. Uh, and that's what I started to do. Uh, because my own space um, and so many artists' space were ruins, I started by sort of copying the infrastructure and wiring and plumbing that would be slapped on the wall, dysfunctional on top of functional on top of dysfunctional, and making arrangements like that. I pick up pieces of debris from a studio floor and enlarge them to like abstract sculptures. I would, um, you know, take impressions of the walls and the floors and make tableau of ruins and things like that. Um, you don't see too many instances of that here, but you'll see a lot of bare bulbs, right, hanging around. And that was, you know, one of the kinds of ways in which I indicated the kind of pastness of the studio. Because um, obviously as a light fixture, the bare bulb was hard to called modern, um, but it is the icon uh, of the artist studio. You see it in all Philip Dustin's paintings of the studios. You see it in Picasso's paintings of studios. You see it in photographs of Dr. Mengi's studios. So it is not only this indication of kind of infrastructure or device of the studio that was dated, but it was also the sort of symbol of the studio. And these bulbs um, are either fluorescent or phosphorescent. And that was way, I've been doing that since way back in the 90s, and I continue to do it today. But I'm still interested in the artifacts of the studio. In fact, the most recent piece here, is it okay if I move around? Yeah. Is this um, dolly, because 
every sculptor, um, if not every painter, needs a dolly in the studio, right? But this dolly, like everything else in the studio, is dysfunctional. And in an attempt to sort of double its efficiency, it's actually made itself completely useless. And there's a little rubber fly seated on it, which I'll say more about later on. Um, this light over here, this double light, is actually a copy of the light fixture in my studio, cast in rubber, that is, it's a copy made in rubber. And the light bulbs um, glow in the dark, but they're not functional, again. They don't give off any light, they simply take any light. So that just gives you some indication of the ways in which I was sort of excavating the studio. But I also started to think, so, you know, what else is sort of frustrating or cumbersome about the studio? Um, and as every artist will test, it's storage, especially for sculptures. Sculptors. Storage is like the ongoing thing. You think you're going to dive all the stuff, you don't know where to put it. It goes in, it goes out, it gets stuck up in the piles. Um, and so in about 2007, I hit on what I thought was a great practical as well as artistic solution. And I started making these functional rubber crates that you see. And I continue to do this. Um, they're rubber, but they actually function. So a piece like this um, actually gets packed in that crate and shipped out to the exhibition and unpacked. Um, same with uh, the globe. Everything there gets packed into that crate, gets shipped out, unpacked. And the same with this other crate that you see here. So that was another aspect of the studio as a sort of Sisyphusian place. You, know, you always have more product than you have I mean, more more stuff than you have product. You have more, you know, 100 pound bags of plaster and, you know, barrels of clay and lots of armature wood and steel and, you know, molds that are always bigger than anything that comes out of it. So compared to what you've actually got in the way of what you've made, what you might call art, right? You've got all this stuff. Um, so that was part of the storage situation. And then I began to think, well, okay, so. The studio's in ruins, it's this compromised place. You know, what if you take it really far and literally the walls fall down? They collapse, they're in such ruin. Then what would happen is that nature would start to literally come growing up through the floorboards and insects and all kinds of small life forms would start to invade. And so there are a number of pieces here where I literally took a mold off my studio floor and then I modeled flowers and cast the rubber and weeds and insects that come up. So, Here's one that's right here. This is literally a cast of my studio floor with all the various insects and weeds coming in now that nature has taken over. Uh, in the corner here is a rolled up version of that same floor with the dandelion weed. I love dandelions, they're so they're such survivors. Um, and you know, they say a weed is just a plant out of place. Um, over there, another floor. Um, so you get the idea, right? Nature has kind of come in and take it over. Okay, well you might ask yourself, well why are they in frames then, some of these flower pieces? And um, I had been making a lot of rubber frame pieces uh, for a long time. So in that sense, it seemed natural to take these weeds and flowers and move them to frames. But I was also thinking about the fact that if you're digging in the rubble of a studio, uh, if it's an old site, then one of the things you're going to come across as you're excavating um, is outworn art forms or art genres like the floral painting, right? Does anybody make floral paintings anymore? Pretty much not, although when you're making a comeback, I'm not sure. But at the time when I started doing these, it was literally a dead genre. So again, I thought this was something I could unearth and bring into the light. And so you have, you know, again, Flowers being eaten by various caterpillars and ants, sometimes being fertilized by some of these same insects. And you have the, that nature being surrounded by the culture of the frame. Um, I'm almost finished. What did I want to say? Um, okay, so who else and what else is in the studio besides objects and infrastructure, architecture, et cetera, storage? Well, here's me, here's the artist. Um, and all my emotions, right? So to begin with, I was just interested in capturing the emotions of the artist in the studio, and sort of typical emotions like pissed off, <laughs> thin-skinned, anxious. And I did this by um, 
making images of least we somaticize motion. So like for anxiety, I made a huge rubber framed piece that was a microscopic enlargement of the bacteria that causes ulcers. Um, or I made a big large sweat pore to indicate labor and sweat. Um, or the skin of the gallbladder, which produces hmm, gall <laughs> or bile. Um, none of those are here, obviously. But what that led me to was doing some real self portraits, some more direct self portraits. And again, I don't have one here, but I made some quite literal self portraits of myself um, tiny, trapped in a box, as a puppet, <laughs> what have you. But then the portraits got a little bit looser, too. Again, as the walls of the studio fall away, and the boundaries between the inside and outside start to dissolve. So too do the boundaries of the self. And so what might be me is no longer just me, it's also say a fly. So that's why you have a self-portrait um, of myself as a fly with eyeglasses. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, you begin to think of yourself as having all these alter egos, um, like Wiley Coyote. Um, I'm sure many people identify with Wiley Coyote because <laughs> he's so he's so much us, right? Full of great ideas, creative, really, ambitious, and he always gets it wrong. He always slams in the ball or falls in the canyon. So Wiley Coyote has become an alter ego for me. Although this is a female Wiley Coyote with breasts, but nevertheless, <laughs> fall through the floor. I have many many other sculptures featuring a feminized. Wiley Coyote as my alter ego. Um, and then the, the last thing I want to say um, before I take any questions if there are any um, is, you know, you might be asking yourself, you know, so why are the globes in here, for instance? And I want it to move on what's there. been happening, I realize, is that again, as as the outside world comes in in the way of nature, in the way of, you know, Bees and insects, which are constantly sort of chomping each other, fertilizing each other. This is an ongoing, you know, um, vitality, a kind of lunar vitality. Once the walls fall down, then the whole world comes in, not just nature, but the whole world. And that's why there's so many globes here and there. So it's like a microcosm, macrocosm thing. The studio hasn't ceased to be the inside of my head, it hasn't ceased to be a very private place, but it has also become microcosm for the whole world. Um, and that's really why we have a piece like this. Um, these two skeletons, I think this is a rather cheerful piece. I know nobody else <laughs> does. Um, it's called Top of the World. But you know, they're still, they're still embracing. <laughs> the world is still turning, even though the flies um, are invading. And the flies aren't necessarily bad people either, or bad, bad, uh, bad elements. Um, I just want to end by saying, since since um, Gary mentioned on the phone after that, yeah, I have no idea if it's still there. Is it still there? <laughs> Real skeletons embracing. Yes, yes. <laughs> I was so touched by that. And there's some story that I can't quite get back in my head about maybe they took refuge in a kind of gully while hordes of invading who knows what, you know, galloped over them when they were killed. I don't know, something like that. But I was just so touched by that image. And I remember somebody saying, Do you believe that image? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't think they made that up? I said, oh, they made that up. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's all I have to say, I think. Um, but I have lots of more information if you have any questions. You would like to ask me? Yeah. How'd you do the um the mold of your floor? Did you like kind of be slip your floor and then put a mold on it? No, as I said, many of these things are made in clay, like oh, if you Oh, yeah, but I didn't do that one this way. This was an exception. So I basically just put like a kind of um, wooden fence around the section of my floor, poured it over down, right? Okay, pulled it up, and I now had a negative on the mold of my floor. And then I put another fence around that mold and poured it in. Sometimes, like this one is one color, sometimes this would be with rubber painted in different colors. But yeah. Yeah. Could you comment on. Um, the fact that that globe is 3D printed and that you seem to intentionally not obscure that fact for us. Um, I didn't obscure it. Well, <laughs> look, you can, yeah. I mean, maybe yeah. it's just me looking closely. No, no, I think if you know, if you've seen any digital sculpture, you recognize that immediately as a digital sculpture. I feel like you could have hidden that entirely. Yeah, I did have to paint it because I hated the surface. Um, I, 
I teach at SBA and they have three degrees in there, right? And so I thought, well, it won't be an idiot to you know, try it, right? So I tried it with a couple things. Um, some of those little scraps of debris that I mentioned early on that I sort of enlarge and clay and cast. I said I would cast some the way I do uh, in rubber, and I would have some digitally enlarged. And I hated to think it was interesting though, because the digital enlargement, this is sort of off the point, but the digital enlargement sort of smoothed off all the edges. Uh, I think quite greatly, that is, if you enlarge it, you're going to get a duller edge, right? Whereas I, with my eye, was just seeing these things. Anyway, so I was not happy with the surface. But when it came to this piece, I thought, I'm going to give it one more try. I'm going to, you know, this is, rubber is incredibly heavy. I'm going to put it on the turntable. I'm going to put the turntable into the deadly. And so um, I had this done. And I hated, hated the surface. And so I painted it um, many times with um, some kind of ivory colored paint. Uh, I was really upset by the surface. So I, <laughs> so I, 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 I have not done any digital stuff since. Well, I have nothing against it. So I, I don't like the surface. I, I, no, I was going to say, I appreciate that because it, it felt, you know, you were talking at the beginning about the onto this digital age and this sort of conflict between the handmade and so the fact that, you know, those those, those fabrication lines are there, yeah. but lets me know how you made it, yeah. um, but it's still, like, not entirely obvious. Like, it's an object you could have just, like, gone to the thrift store and purchased, but you chose to fabricate it, so I really like that I could see those lines. And I don't, you know, honestly, I mean, I think there are times I just... It makes sense to use digital. You know, it just makes sense. Um, you know, why go crazy doing something? But if there's some aspect of it you don't like, then obviously you're going to not choose that for that particular piece. Obviously, I love, I love novel. So, I have a question. Um, this may, this may be a really weird question, but when you worked in the studio, did you? Feel like you were fly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you feel, you know, I feel, I feel, I guess, especially when, yeah. Can we describe that? Yeah, I was just, just trying to figure out what I meant by that. Um, well, you feel insignificant. You feel, you feel that what you make is garbage. So, why wouldn't you be? You know, feel your own garbage. I mean, I'm sort of literalizing something that's basically just a feeling of failure, you know, and insignificance, I suppose. And also, um, you know, I think, you know, if you really want to sort of summarize everything here, you say, well, this is all a kind of memento mori or a gravitas, it's a reminder of death. Even at the same time, I think it's very much about regeneration as well. And so the flies are, have, you know, traditionally been a sign of dissolution. You know, what is, um, what is, um, oh, my mind's going blank. Um, Emily Dickinson says, she says, I heard a fly buzz when I die. <laughs> on the other hand, Descartes sees a fly on the wall and invents the Cartesian grid. It's, it's something, two different things. Um, but yeah, in a funny way, I feel like a fly. I feel like, I feel like, why the coyote? I feel, I think most artists, many, many artists anyway, feel this way. I think many people feel this way, no matter what. I, I identify with a fly. <laughs> Maybe that's why I want to emphasize someone who's working. Sorry? Maybe that's why I want to emphasize because you feel like a fly. Yes. That's right. Maybe I got it backwards. Maybe it's because I feel like the fly came in. <laughs> <laughs> also, I was uh, utterly fascinated by the two uh, films called The Fly, one in the 1850s, one in the 1880s, and that notion of hubris. Um, I mean, one of the things you know I talked about earlier on was the fact that the studio had been for a long time, so long been the case, um, the province of the individual male genius, right? Um, and both those films are about the hubris of individual male genius and what goes wrong um, uh, when you get into that kind of hubris. It doesn't necessarily have to be male; it's traditionally been male. But the notion of hubris and reaching and ambition somehow creating a monster. And artists are very ambitious. Uh, even if they can't act on it, even if they're too shy to do anything about it, in their, in, their, in their minds, they're always ambitious. They're always overreaching. And um, so there was some sort of identification for me, I guess. 
um, with this notion of a project you undertake that, oh, you know, it makes someone look brilliant and ends up, you know, creating a monster, a mutation of some kind. So I think that's another reason why I always love flies. I say love the flies, identify the flies. And you're the lord of the flies. And then the world is Absolutely. Another question. Yeah. I was drawn to the dandelion art space, the one with the ice cream. Oh, yeah. What, uh, how did you get inspiration to make that? Well, um, as you can see, there are a lot of dandelions growing. They were the first weed to come up through the studio. I'll just say for a minute, too, that, you know, um, in terms of technique, each of these petals, my three of them, are made in clay, and then I, you know, cast them many times and stuck them together with more rubber. And each, you know, each of these was made in clay, so it's very time consuming. Uh, but the short of it is that I have these bolts, <laughs> so I can make more dandelions, having put in all that work. So I'm fond of dandelions for many, many reasons. First of all, um, and this is not something I knew when I started working with dandelions, you can get rubber from dandelions. I don't know. I use nice surprises. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and also, dandelions can, for one dandelion, I don't know, like 10,000, I don't know, there's some incredible number of other dandelions. But anyway, to answer your question, so there was that. I, I, I made many, many dandelions. I had them old, uh, and I was fooling around with them. And I have used a lot of ice in my work. Um, I don't have any examples of it here more to show you, but. Way back in the early 90s, one of these tableaus of destruction in the studio um, had icicles as if somehow, you know, height or things had frozen over. So there's been a lot of icicles in my work in general. And so, I don't know, it just seemed like icicles, dandelions. You'd never find that in nature, right? Because dandelions are not around when it's, there's a frost like that. So it was another, it was a little bit like this thing, but it's a paradox. And many of the flowers. Not so much here, you know, um, are toxic or like this, obviously gross, <laughs> um, the poisonous. Um, they indicate some kind of danger or decay. Like Pink Rose is actually named after Drake's poem, uh, or those that are sick. Yeah. So I think the dandelion freezing to me was this the state of impossibility again, this kind of war between the two things, um, endangering the dandelion, but they're still there. Thank you very much.